Hello and welcome to another episode of our Achieve podcast. I am Trent Kelsey and uh, the co to my host over here, Jesse Johns, working the soundboard. Say hey, Jesse. Hello, everybody. For our guest today, we have Professor Mark Sanders. Mark is a professor of philosophy and ethics and English here at Three Rivers College. Uh, good morning. Good to be here with you today. Good, good. I've taken a, a couple of your philosophy classes, so just kind of like to get things started, I just want to ask you, what is it that makes you love philosophy? It's the uh, ultimate search for meaning in human life. It's uh, asking the questions that uh, all of us have wondered about uh, at one point or another in our lives, um, but uh, there's there's no definitive answer. And so the uh, the the journey, the searching for the questions, uh, is the point of that. And uh, that's it's what I find most fascinating about the subject. So this fascination, this uh, drive for the answer to these questions, is this something that kind of developed early in your life, or did it kind of strike you one day? I've always had questions since I was uh, a toddler, since I was old enough to talk. I've always had an innate curiosity, and in whenever I encounter people doing things or if information, I've always had questions. I've uh, something that I've probably annoyed uh, <laughs> my my teachers. Uh, at every level is just consistently asking questions, uh, uh, always hungry for more information. So yeah, I think that's something I was probably born with. Yeah, yeah, I, I love asking questions too. I mean, I think that's uh, something that I enjoy about being a interviewer. So um, <laughs> now I understand you're also a writer. You've written two books. I, I have. Uh, I've completed and self-published two books. That's uh, Dylan's Treasure and the Spring of... Lanfalin. Lanfalin. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that, well, that's the sequel, right? Correct. And then I am currently in the middle of the second revision of uh, the third book called Shannon's Promise, and that is the uh, conclusion of this trilogy of novels. Okay. Okay. Uh, how's your uh, writing process? Is it? Um, does Do you have to make yourself sit down and uh, just kind of get something down every so often or does something just come to you and then you have to you know grab a pen and paper and it's really interesting because with the first book I uh, I did a lot of plotting it was it was more plot driven and and I found at a certain point I had actually written myself out of the plot my my, my plan wasn't going to work with how the characters and the situation had developed so I just threw it away and, oh, yeah. and wrote what I thought was uh, going to happen. So I took that experience, and with the second book, it was much more free form. Just sort of okay, we're going to start from this point and then see what happens. And I I made a lot of really interesting discoveries along the way. With with this third book, I approached it in a way that I never have, where I really wrote a first draft. My, my writing process itself has always been very slow because I try to wordsmith as I go. So each word, each sentence comes very slowly when you write that way. Well, this one, it was just all about getting the story done. So instead of taking three or four years to complete a first draft like I did with the first two books, I completed this first draft in 14 months. That does put more work in the revision and editing process, you know, because I've got, I've got sentences where I use the adverb quickly four times in one mm -hmm. sentence, you know, and it's like, okay, this is garbage. You have to change all this. That's when you break out the thesaurus, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, how long you been uh, writing books for? I started the first book all the way back in the mid nineties. And then I got married and had kids and kind of just put it on the shelf and was focusing on on career and, and raising a family and then at some point I said you know I I want to finish this and um, tried uh, tried to get both of the first two books published professionally uh, and didn't find much luck then but because of the way that uh, Amazon has developed self-publishing technology I was not only able to uh, publish and market those books, but I was also able to uh, design the way that they looked. Um, I've also uh, been a graphic designer since I got out of college. That's right, uh, graphic designer and printing industry, right? Yes, um, I went to a journalism school at the University of Missouri intending to be a print journalist, 
And uh, I, I discovered both an affinity and a, and a love for graphic design, you know, putting together magazine and newspaper pages, posters, ads, billboards, uh, things like that. And so, yeah, I was, uh, I was in the printing industry uh, from uh, 1992 through uh, 1999 when I started uh, here at the college. And then um, I, I did graphic design for several years here at the college, and I still do a few design projects, including our Spelling Bee program and the Confluence Literary Journal. Does your uh, love for philosophy kind of bleed into your writing a bit? Oh, absolutely. Uh, this this third book, I think a lot of a lot of people, especially students who have had me for classes, are going to recognize a lot of the influences because um, my experience with classical mythology, with philosophy, with religion, with ancient history, um, with uh, biblical texts. It's all in there. It's this is everything but the kitchen sink in here, and I I, I think a lot of people are really going to enjoy it. Yeah, uh, anyone who's interested, both of Mark's books are available on Amazon, and they are also available on the landfillinkingdom.com. That's L L A N F Y L L I N Kingdom.com. Yeah, when uh, when I first started writing the original story, I was I was looking for a place to center it. And I've, um, I'm a big fan of Shakespeare, so you know the British Isles have always fascinated me. So I was looking on an atlas, and I and I just noticed all of these really cool, you know, Tolkien-sounding names mm -hmm. in. Uh, it's in, a fantasy series. Yes, yeah, um, in uh, Wales, uh, which is uh, the um, the western the the western part of uh, the the main British Isle, and so yeah, I just I just took a map and then started cutting and pasting places, and and so yeah, that's a lot of hard to pronounce names, mm -hmm. but I, I think they look cool. Well, uh, Lanfalin, that's a that's a real thing. I was looking up how to pronounce it, so I saw a review of your book that said it was if if you like the Princess Bride, which. I mean, everybody. Everybody who's seen the Princess Bride or read the Princess Bride, I haven't read it, but I love the movie. Yes, the uh, the the first book is my my two protagonists meeting, getting to know each other, and eventually falling in love. Uh, Dylan is is the the youngest prince of the king of the kingdom, and uh, Shannon is a very unusual character for medieval. She she is a lady knight. She's she's the only one. And um, the action in the first book centers around an annual knight's tournament. So a little bit of Princess Bride, and if you've seen um, A Knight's Tale mm -hmm. with um, Is that Heath, a, Ledger, Heath Ledger, with yeah. Heath, Heath Ledger, rest in there's, peace. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, then there is um, there's there's a good deal of that. So I mean, you know, you've got fighting, you've got jousting, you've got archery, you you've got. Um, you know, one-on-one -on -one sword combat. It's it's all a little bit of that. So it's an adventure, and then and then the romance of the two of them, you know, getting to know each other and you know seeing how things will end up there. Interesting fact: I never watched that movie with Heath Ledger, and uh, I want to say I seen The Princess Bride a long time ago, but I do not remember anything about it. It's definitely worth a rewatch. The yes. Princess Bride is just one of those like perfect movies, you know, right, that never right. fails. Um, yeah. So for those who are kind of like new or don't really know much about philosophy, but are kind of curious and they don't really want to break open the textbook, you know, is there any like certain work of media that you would recommend to them uh, to kind of introduce them, be it like a book or a movie? Well, two of the resources that I use in my class are very accessible to every student. The first one I would recommend is Crash Course Philosophy. You can just go to YouTube and search Crash Course Philosophy, and I believe there's more than 50 different episodes. Yeah, yeah. Is that is that John Green or? It's actually his brother his Hank. Brother Hank. Yeah, yeah I get Hank them mixed Green. up. They, they, they look a lot alike. And then the other resource that I rely on uh, quite often is uh, a YouTube site called Philosophy Tube, and it was started by a young man who was majoring in philosophy at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And he was thinking, wow, I'd like to, sh you know, I'm, I'm getting this great education in philosophy. I'd like to share it with other people who maybe, you know, don't have the opportunity to study. They're short videos. They're very accessible. He's a very engaging personality. And uh, so, yeah, that's philosophy tube. For me, it was the good place. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that... 
I mean, it's it's goofy, it's fun, it's comedy, but they really know how to like relay certain like philosophical uh, concepts like really well, especially in such a. I mean, if you haven't seen the show, uh, I, re I highly recommend it. But it's it's kind of the case where they're in this magical place where anything can happen and you, you take the like the famous trolley problem for example mm -hmm. i remember the episode where they actually did the trolley problem for real put the guy uh with the levers yes. and he had to make the decision and uh yeah it's a it's a great show super funny super entertaining but you know you really get something out of it yeah. philosophy wise the good place is my favorite show of all time and i figured uh, and all four seasons are available to binge watch on netflix oh yeah uh, Jesse, if you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend it. Yeah, I never watched a good place. I, interesting fact for me, I don't watch much TV shows anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, me, yeah, me neither. Uh, it's like, I know some of them are so good, but, you know, it, I, yeah. I have a hard enough with movies. I yeah. have a whole shelf yeah. that I have to get through. And uh, I'm the same way, and and I know this weekend, oh, shout out to the new James Bond movie that came out this weekend. We will be discussing that, absolutely. Yeah. Me and yeah. Jesse saw it, so... Just uh, stay tuned for that. It will be a good, uh, lengthy uh, Excellent. commentary on that. For anyone who's not maybe not familiar with The Good Place, um, Mike Schur is the creator of that. He was part of the writing team for The Office, mm -hmm. and he was also the creator of Parks and Rec, and he uh, also is the mind behind Brooklyn 99. Yeah, yeah. So if you know any of those shows, The Good Place has the, the, the same kind of feel to it. I heard the show The Office. I want to say I watched like a few episodes, but I'm just going to get in The Office. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you don't like The Office, uh, you might like Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec, it, it, it's, I, for me, it's less serious in The Office at some point. It's not as like realistic as they were trying with that show. Right, right. But it, it, it just really like focuses on the comedy. Um, yeah, uh, Michael Schur, I actually heard that he took an intro to philosophy class in high school, and that was that kind of like implanted in his brain, mm -hmm. even though he didn't like go on with like you know a, a career in that it just kind of stuck with him and then whenever he he became a television producer or writer or whatever uh he thought you know that this could be something that we could you know make something out of yeah and and the show actually had real life philosophers as consultants to help yeah. them you know so it's all it's all very accurate in terms of, of the kind of ideas that you would encounter in a philosophy class is there a, a certain philosophical quandary or even concept that like baffles you? Uh, maybe something you've gone back and forth on for your entire career? Well, what really baffles me more than anything is how people still hold on to the concept of universal relativism. The, the idea, in the, in the sense of ideas, it is that, well, there's no such thing as truth. It's just whatever you believe in is true for you, and it may not be true for someone else. And then when we apply that to morality, it's like, well, I may think that something is right, but then you may disagree and you think that something else is right. Mm -hmm. Now, that's certainly true to a certain extent. We all have different opinions about things. We all have different preferences. But in the, in the absence of what we call objective truth, just some things that are, that are factually true and are right all the time, and in terms of morality, things that – are always right or always wrong, no matter what time, place, or situation. Getting people to understand that has been the biggest challenge, and we're actually seeing the consequences of relativistic thinking taking place in our world today. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how much more evidence do you need before you're convinced that you, you know, that we've we've elevated personal belief to the level of absolute truth and staying concrete in your own personal beliefs while that might be important to you sometimes you know it might step on other people's beliefs and that whole conflict it just it it doesn't really resolve in much but chaos and, and the heart of philosophy is following the truth wherever it leads and that's really uncomfortable for some people because part of the philosophical process is recognizing that some of the things that you believe are true turn out not to be true mm -hmm. and what philosophers do is that we change our beliefs and, yeah and uh for for a lot of people you know just admitting that they were wrong or that they didn't understand anything is is very difficult so you know philosophy philosophy in, as a as a lifestyle as a life choice is not easy because you're you continue to ask questions and the most important questions are the ones that you ask yourself it's like are the things that I believe are that are true 
actually true. What baffles me, and this is a, this is a lot of stuff we go over in class, is these um, famous philosophers throughout history who developed this one theory, this one ideal, this one whole philosophy about everything. They mm -hmm. write the book, and then they're like, that's it. That's it. I figured it out. No more. No. For me, when you take a philosophical concept and you say, this is it. We figured it out. There, there's no more philosophy. Like, the, For me, philosophy is a constant unending string of questions and you kind of come to the answer but not quite well even even science shows us you know that this is not it's it's not the way that reality works astronomy used to be a branch of philosophy before we developed telescopes and spaceships and mm -hmm. space probes and things like that philosophers would just sort of speculate about the nature of the planets and the stars and the sun and the moon and, and all these things. And eventually science progressed to the point where it said, well, this isn't philosophy anymore. It's, it's an actual science. But look at what astronomy has done since the Hubble Space Telescope or the other space telescope that we've put there. And, you know, we, we've discovered that not only are there billions of stars in the universe, there's billions of galaxies mm -hmm. in the universe and trillions of stars. And every time we think we know something about the universe, you know, every, every discovery leads to 20, 30, 40 new questions about things that are unknown. Mm -hmm. So, um, and philosophy is exactly the same. I don't think we ever get to a point where we can say, okay, we know, we know this for certain and there's nothing else for us to learn in this area. I, I think that's, that's, more human pride than it is philosophical honesty it's it's what keeps humanity going if we figure everything out then you know what it, what's left right right exactly and and i think i think it's part of our human nature to continue to to seek the new to yeah. seek the unknown the, the fact that our minds are capable of asking questions drives us to find new questions to ask and uh times change you know uh ways ways of life change culture so that kind of leads me into my next question. Is there a particular philosopher throughout history that you would want to debate or discuss with? Oh, I would definitely want to meet Immanuel Kant. Um, ask him, it's like, look, you know your ethical system doesn't work, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you can't, you can't resolve moral imperatives in conflict. So what's, what's the deal? And then I would talk to him about his, uh, his theory of the way the way that the mind works, that each of us, in effect, creates our own individual reality because our perceptions of the world around us are unique to our own conscious minds. I, I, think, it, I think it's the greatest idea in philosophy. Yeah, and if you've seen The Good Place, you, you know Kant, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see. Yes, I, I have that in common with Chidi, where, yes, Kant yeah. is my favorite philosopher. Is there a certain piece that you have read that made you want to be a writer? Stephen King. Yeah. For the, the it, Arthur, the clown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm still working on that book. I got it years ago. It's such a, it's a brick, you know, it. Well, is it, well, I never read the book. I seen both the movies. Oh yeah. So I have, I, I've seen the movie. The, the book is like, it's like 1100 something pages. Go, yeah. It's yeah, like, man. it's like a, it's, if you need to like level a table or something. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a project. It's what, and you know, if all you've experienced of it is the movies, the, the book will shock and surprise you. Oh there's, yeah. There's some things in the book that, they would never put in a movie today that are really really shocking absolutely when it when it comes to adapting that into a movie it's not what can we change it's what do we need to take out because if you well first of all like you said it would shock um but it, there's just so much in there you mm -hmm. could have you know like a two season series right. adapt, adapting that whole thing yeah i would uh i would love to see one of uh stephen king's books you know get the the 10 or 12 episode Netflix series mm -hmm. treatment. Uh, some, of, some of his longer books like It or, or The Stand, you know, you could, you could probably break those up into three or four, eight to 10 episode seasons. If, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm very particular about what they do with Stephen King. Uh, Paramount Plus used to be CBS All Access, did an eight episode update of The Stand, and it was just terrible. They, they essentially just, 
threw the book away and yeah. said, "We're gonna we're gonna do something completely different." And it, and it, I, I thought it was awful. I, yeah. I stopped watching about halfway through. Were there any Stephen King movies or books or not related to horror or just more like thrillers? The Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank Redemption is a, which Stephen is a great King. movie. Uh, is it? Stand by Me, which uh, from the eighties is a is a great mm-hmm. uh, teenager. Uh, you know, young teen, really, if you're in uh, middle school or junior high, stand by me, uh-huh. as long as your parents don't object to bad language. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know he did the Dark Tower book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I actually, I got to watch that one in theaters when it first came out. I yeah. heard that that one, it didn't do too well. They, they were planning a whole series or something, but the first movie kind of like yeah. squashed that. A- you know? Again, you know, what they're, what they're doing is trying to, trying to improve on history will look back at Stephen King the same way they do at William Shakespeare. I know mm-hmm. that's a bold statement, but I mean, when you look at, when you look at popular literature and Shakespeare was a popular writer, um, when you look at popular literature in the late 20th, early 21st century, Stephen King is going to be absolutely at the top of the pyramid. Yeah. And Stephen King, I mean, maybe aside from JK Rowling, I don't know the exact numbers, but he's probably the biggest writer alive today. Yeah. And- so he has, he has countless fans. People always read his books. They're always a bestseller. So whenever you adapt it, you have people who are going to come, you know, watch these movies, watch these TV series. What are you changing it for? Right. And we, you know, we understand that you have to make some changes for movies. Some. But, right, some. Like with the movie Dr. Sleep that mm-hmm. came out, Dr. Sleep is is a the novel is a sequel to The Shining. It's one of my favorites, probably top 10 all-time favorite Stephen King book. I love the book, Dr. Sleep. The movie, the first two-thirds of the movie was great, and then they reach a point where they decided that what they were doing was making a sequel to Stanley Kubrick's movie, right. The Shining, and the last third of the movie is nothing like the book oh yeah I mean, um, just completely different and i was <laughs> i wanted to get up and leave out of the theater yeah it's it's kind of a it's kind of a tricky thing because i know stephen king he didn't like that adaptation but that movie is considered to be you know one of the best movies of all time right so whenever you're adapting dr sleep what do you do i mean a lot of people who haven't read the books they they're expecting it to be you know direct kubrick but you also have people who are fans of the books, so you kind of got to find that middle ground. But right. I haven't seen the movie; it's on my list. Uh, I, but I saw the trailer, and I saw a whole lot of you know Kubrick imagery. If you if you loved the, mo- the loved the original movie, The Shining, and if you haven't read the book, Doctor Sleep, you'll probably enjoy the movie. I never read the book for Doctor Sleep, but I have watched Doctor Sleep movie. Did you like it? Um, I watched the director's cut version. For what I seen of it, 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 I liked it so. Have you seen The Shining? It is a fact. I only seen clips of The Shining. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> very. You know, it is. It is uh, October, Halloween coming up. So if you want to watch yeah. a scary movie, The Shining is definitely a scary yeah. movie. Oh yeah, I know there was one part in the movie in The Shining where he might be up this door or something, and then he went, "Here's Johnny." Oh yeah, yeah the most iconic. Yeah, one definitely. of the most iconic scenes in movie history. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that you would uh, like to add? Maybe uh, something about philosophy or just you know life. Yeah, one of the things that uh, that I wanted to mention was um, a lot of uh, a lot of people saying, "Well, what's the good of philosophy? You know, what you can do with it? You know, and and for college students, you know, when you're when you're thinking about you know choosing a major, choosing a path in life, you know, what what can you do with it? And uh, obviously, teaching philosophy is uh, one of those things. But but one of the things that has been happening. Uh, over the past several years is that uh, for anyone who's maybe considering a career in law, going to law school after completing a bachelor's degree, many law schools today are really looking for philosophy majors, somebody with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. In fact, when I was taking my graduate courses uh, in philosophy for my academic credentials, most of the undergrads, the ones who are working on their bachelor's degrees, were there because they were planning on going on to law school because the things that we see in philosophy critical thinking asking questions uh, research formulating arguments all of those are skills that that transfer very well into the practice of law so uh, you know now traditionally uh, history and political science have been sort of like the breeding ground 
uh, for, a, for a pre-law degree. And uh, I love both of those pursuits too. But uh, you, you know, if, if anyone was like, oh, I want to major in philosophy and your mom or your dad says, well, what can you do with that? It's like, <laughs> well, I can be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that kind of setting could definitely use um, some background in ethics. Which, oh, absolutely. Yeah, which is uh, the course that we're going over right now. Uh, yes. I, I'm in uh, the ethics course currently. Yeah, and uh, just one last thing for any Three Rivers students. We, we do offer uh, three different philosophy courses. Philosophy 200, Introduction to Philosophy, and it just covers the, the basics of five different areas in philosophy. Uh, philosophy 233, Ethics, where we focus on ethics and morality and we also talk about a lot of current events issues and applying a moral philosophy to that and then philosophy 243 religions of the world and we look at the the major religions and the the basic tenets and practices of all of their beliefs well you heard it here from mark sanders mark thank you for coming on you've been a terrific guest um i'd like to uh plug your blog oh yeah yeah that's that's terrific yeah um I'm currently involved in Blogtober, which is a month-long daily writing project. So I'm in the midst of creating a new story live day by day. And uh, you can um, look for Blogtober 2021 on Facebook. And that is, uh, that is a public group, so you can view that. And then uh, all of my other blog entries uh, are in the blog tab at my website. Again, that's Lanfalin Kingdom, L-L-A-N-F-Y-L-L-I-N Kingdom.com. Well, Mark, thank you. Thanks for having me. Had a great time. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mark Sanders, for coming on our show today. And if you heard it, if you're interested in philosophy, go to the Three Rivers College and uh, see what they offer. And this is Trent Kelsey and Just John sign out. And away we go.